purpose of the award today is to recognize a nationally acclaimed American Indian author who has contributed greatly to contemporary literature. Previous winners were Joy Harjo in 2001, Vine Deloria in 2003, and Leslie Marvin Silco. The award consists of a $5,000 cash prize and a bronze medallion. Thanks to the generous contributions of the Maxine and Jack Zero Family Foundation, I'd like to ask Mr. Jack Zero to please stand, please. The Bank of Oklahoma, Cherokee Builders, Inc., and the Tulsa Library Trust, without their support, the award would not be possible. I also want to recognize those who helped select this year's winner, the American Indian Resource Center Advisory Committee and the Author Selection Committee. If any of you are here today, would you please stand so we can recognize you. The vision of our community volunteers continues to be instrumental in creating and guiding this valuable resource. The American Indian Resource Center features more than 7,000 books, materials, and media about and by American Indian artists, ranging from languages to information for teachers. We live in a state rich with American Indian history, art, and culture. The American Indian language and literature from storytelling to poetry are alive in our state and inspiring a new generation of Oklahomans. Resource Center Coordinator Rental, Teresa Reynolds, continues to grow our collection for the future. This year's winner will be introduced by Stephen Woods. Stephen Woods teaches Native American Studies at the Tulsa Community College and was on the selection committee to select our uh, recipient this year. Stephen, please come forward. Hello, Jill, and welcome this morning. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, to you Paula Stabler. She is a communications officer from the office of the, the Principal Chief, Jim Gray, from the Osage Nation. And she would like to present a, uh, a message on behalf of the Osage Nation. So please welcome Paula Stabler. Good morning. The first thing that I notice on this, uh, on your uh, uh, pamphlet today, is that it says that our princess is here today. And I promise you that Osage Tribe has a very young, very beautiful princess that she was unable to attend today. So I'm very proud to be here. I'm here on behalf of the Osage Nation, Principal Chief Jim Gray, and Assistant Principal Chief John Manigal. At this time, I'd like to say to you, it is an honor to be here today. I'm proud to say our nation was here long before statehood, and we are commemorating 150 years on the Osage Reservation. On March 1st, we will celebrate 100 years after 100 years, our first year of our new government and true sovereignty for our nation. Along with many sweeping changes, our leadership has embarked on a strategic planning process, and they are meeting with those sages all around the United States as we speak. Principal Chief Jim Gray and Assistant Principal Chief John Redigal send their regrets for not being here to honor Mr. Carter Rebar today. I'm here to deliver this message, along with a proclamation of excellence to Mr. Rebar's honor. Mr. Rebar. The Osage Nation is indeed proud of your accomplishments and wishes to present you with this proclamation, award of excellence, and the Osage Nation congratulates you today and wishes you continued success. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our honored author. He was born on the 25th of March in 1931 in Pawhuska, the capital of the Osage Nation. And he grew up in the Buck Creek Valley there between Pawhuska and Bartlesville and was graduated along with his six brothers and sisters from the Buck Creek Rural District 66 school, a one-room schoolhouse that included the first through the eighth grades. In 1948, he was graduated from Bartlesville College High School. As a senior, he competed in a radio quiz show, winning a first-year scholarship to attend the University of Tulsa. With additional scholarships, support from an admired professor, Franklin Eikenberry, and good hard work, he was graduated with honors from TU, earning both a baccalaureate degree and winning a Rhodes Scholarship in 1952. 
Thus traveling to England for additional study, he earned a Master of Arts degree from Oxford University in 1954, and upon returning to the States, he earned his Doctor of Philosophy in English from Yale in 1959. Upon receiving his terminal degree, he was a lecturer in English <coughs> language and literature at Amherst College. In 1961, he was appointed to the faculty of Washington University in St. Louis, where he taught English and American Indian literatures. A respected scholar, he has published numerous articles contributing to the fields of medieval English literature, linguistics, and of course, American Indian literature. He has also taught as a visiting professor at the University of Tulsa and the University of Oklahoma. <coughs> He retired from teaching in 1997, but continues to do research and publish his work in journals and conference proceedings. In addition to his scholarly publications, he is an accomplished poet and essayist, publishing six books of poems and essays, the very books that we're here today celebrating. His book of poems, An Eagle Nation, won the Oklahoma Book Award for Poetry in 1994. Family Matters, Tribal Affairs, a great title, was a finalist in the nonfiction category for the Oklahoma Book Award in 1999, while winning the Dust Bowl was a finalist in 2002. His most recent book, How the Songs Come Down, was published in 2005. He was named Writer of the Year in 2000 by the WordCraft Circle of Writers, and he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas in 2005. In addition to these honors, the spring 2003 issue of the journal Sale which is Studies in American Indian Literatures, was devoted to a, a review of his work. Despite the prominence he's achieved in academia, he considers his highest honor to have been given his Osage name in 1952. In a ceremony arranged by his grandmother, Josephine Jaffe, he was given the name Nompawadu, which literally means fear inspiring. But the name also recalls the role of sacred thunder in preparing the way for Osage people and more importantly, binds the identity of the recipient, in his words, carefully, explicitly, and unmistakably, within a family and within a people. With this name comes a voice, and few writers have developed their voice as well as our honorary. Yet though his voice is strong and clear, distinguished, he would be the first to say that it is not his alone. Indeed, he has likened himself to a mockingbird, singing more than one song, and hopefully with a family voice. There's no better evidence of this concern for family than the fact that he has family here today, his brother Jim John, his cousin Casey Camp Hornick, and her husband Mike. His family extends, <coughs> the songs he sings of family includes Osages and Pongos, but it's also people from other tribes and other places, indeed, even other times. In his writing, then, we find an integration of various voices, an integration that allows us to hear and to get to know people like Uncle Gus, the champion fancy dancer, Aunt Jewel, the beloved matriarch. We hear the voices of Coyote, who tells us why he sings, and the Eagle, who helps our prayers rise. We hear stories of cowboys and Indians, dinosaurs and astronauts. This voice makes a difference in our lives. It makes us laugh and it makes us cry. This voice makes music in a way that changes our world, just like the storm, the thunderstorm, changed the world of Coyote. And so now, without further delay, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you the 2007 American Indian Festival of Words Author Award recipient, Carter Rebo. On behalf of the Tulsa City County Library American Indian Resource Center and the, the 2007 Festival of Awards, author award, Mr. Carter Rebard, and with this uh, beautiful medallion also comes an honorarium of $5,000. Uh, Carter, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. introduce to you uh, Lewis Gray, uh, Osage, a well-known journalist, uh, former editor of the Native American Times. He's currently a substance abuse counselor 
He's the president of the Tulsa Indian Coalition Against Racism. He's a champion straight dancer and spent many years as a tail dancer uh, in the Osage, in uh, I'd like to introduce you to Louis Gray. Well, it's an honor to uh, speak on behalf of an elder and a, and a true uh, artist. So, my brother, uh, Arch Mason, is supposed to be up here with me. He's unable to make it this time. But we are going to, you know, we have uh, been big fans, I guess is a, one way to put it, of uh, the life and times of Carter Rebar. And, uh, he understands something about our people back home is sort of unknown or to a greater uh, population is that the connection between the Pampas and the Osage Indians is, is uh, sort of hard to describe, but it, it's real. And, uh, and sometimes there's some intermarriage. So he's got a unique perspective of the Pampa Osage experience. You know, we, we, we carry on our traditions thanks to the Pampas, and we help them carry on their traditions thanks to that relationship that we've made as, as uh, Indian people, we, uh, we're similar, you know, the, the Osages are part of a language and uh, culture group called the Gia. And it's the Pampas, the Osages, Kaws, Omahas, and Kaws. And so we understand each other, but we're different. And so they, about 125 years ago, the, the Pampas and the cause brought over this drum that originated with the uh, Pampa people. And we still dance it. You know, we danced it every year since uh, 1884 uh, in Pahaska District. And it's been good to us. And the Pampas have the same and they understand how those songs are supposed to go. And so, you know, we have all this relationship with them, and they come over, and they camp with us, and they, we eat for four days in three different locations, three different weekends, and we understand each other. Sometimes the pumpkins will come a week, several weeks ahead of time and stay. And so, they develop relationships. I uh, my you know, own relationships with family, uh, have a relationship with the Leclerc family and the warrior family. And so those are my relations. And so when I go over there, I'm treated like family. And, I, and they go over here, I, I extend the same uh, kindness to them. I was killing time. <laughs> <laughs> we awarded this blanket to him earlier, but we wanted to share what it looked like. Uh, cause, yeah. The trustees is proud of this blanket, so <laughs> and we're proud of Carter. So I'm going to hold it up. Oh, wow. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> Council of the Library with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Now there are going to be some of my Osage folks that may be horrified here because I'm going to say a few words. 
and uh, who knows whether they can understand them. <laughs> but I will try. My brother Jim has been teaching me some. He's taken the Osage language courses there. Iekola, eakite kombra. Hoe ajin ovala majin. I want to say a few words. I can talk, but not well. Zani wabi oing di. Zani wabi oing di kombra. I want to address everyone as friends and relatives. What is the Okshetong green the ha Iko Aba Owe Nabe Jaje no Bewale Ankube? And says In literary study, when I have done well, grandmother was pleased, and the name Nom Bewale she gave to me. I meant to offer my gratitude in those few broken and badly spoken words from a beautiful language in grave danger of dying to the beautiful city county library and all its people dedicated to keeping alive our past. And they today are honoring me as an American Indian author with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And knowing that before me, the American Indian writers given this award were Joy Carjo, Vine Deloria Jr., and Leslie Mommins, Marvin Soko, I'm humbled. And all the more honored that is being given to me today. So I wish to express my deep gratitude on this occasion to the board and members of the City County Library staff, to Teresa Runnels and the American Indian Resources Council, and to Teresa, and to Aaron Studebaker, and all the others for all the hard work and care given to arranging this event, and the great hospitality and food and conversation provided last night by Robin Ballinger and guests at dinner, and also thanks for inviting my Osage and Ponca relatives uh, who have come here to be feasted and honored on this occasion. My brother Jim, my cousin Casey, are on the front row here. Jim probably won't stand up, but if you guys would like to stand, could I get you to? <laughs> and Jim, you can chastise me later for my mispronunciation. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for that. And uh, I began by speaking those few words in Osage. I want to think aloud a little bit about what it means to keep a language alive, as our Osage people are heroically and valiantly doing in this 21st century, after 200 years of powerful and partly successful efforts to destroy this language by those who were designated as guardians of our Osage people. I recognize and admit that it is my fault I do not speak Osage. When I was a child, our Osage grandmother, Mrs. Josephine Strykax Young, born in the 1890s, had grown up speaking Osage with all her folks, and at the age of 10 was put into a school to learn English. After four years, she spoke English well, and she then was married to our grandfather, Jacob Young, also a native speaker of Osage, and Jacob's mother, born in Kansas in 1851, lived through the Civil War there, and then walked down into our Osage, Oklahoma reservation when we were forced to move here in the 1870s. Grandma St. John never learned to speak English, although she lived until 1941, age 90. <coughs> and I remember her and Grandma Josephine coming to our house out in Buck Creek about 1937, probably, as I think of it, 
for the first birthday and the, the year's feast of my brother, uh, Louis James Jump, who was born on July 15, 1936, and given the name Akida Kahika, soldier chief. I remember Grandma St. John fixing meat pies and corn soup on that occasion in 1937, when she, at age 86, four score and seven years old, almost, would smile and speak to us grandchildren in Osage, and Grandma Josephine would tell us in English what she was saying. Jacob and Josephine Jump had four children. Uh, our stepfather, my stepfather, Jim's dad, uh, Addison Jump uh, Sr., uh, and Aunt Arita Jump, and Uncle Louis Jump, and Uncle Kenneth Jump. And a photo of them is seen in my book, Winning the Dust Bowl, when their dad, Jacob Jump, was serving in the U.S. Army during World War I. I guess only a couple of them in that picture, but the others. But the four children in school were not allowed to speak Osage, as far as I know, and none of them became fluent in it, although understanding was there. The official policy of the U.S. was that Indians needed to forget the past and move into the future, and the Osage part of the past that must be uh, abandoned and forgotten was of no use to them. So uh, I just, I'm not going to go on about it. I just put those things in front of you. And they are policy decisions at very high levels that in effect say <coughs> that an entire artifact, say, <coughs> the most complicated and probably beautiful thing that human beings ever make, a language for human people. That was to be destroyed and thrown away. And that, that seems sad to me. Uh, but the resistance is still going on. Keep the good, keep the brilliance of everyday creativity that a language allows you. There is common genius in the language. Nobody can say who made it. Nearly all the wonderful figures of speech that we get, that we get from black English, from all the other kinds of uh, dialects of English now, uh, that in every language you get. All these wonderful figurative poems, little tiny seed poems that people make in a language. Uh, that, that's part of what is daily bread. That's manna from heaven. It's not ordinary, except that we all do it and without thinking a lot. And we have that resource. Just think for a moment what happens if somebody takes that from you. And you're lying there or sitting there and you can't speak. How do you know? Now think of a whole people that that's done to. Let's try and keep it. And Mogren Lookout, Van Bidforce, and people over here, and people in the different tribes, the Ponca people, the Pawnee people, all of us are trying to keep those languages alive and to bring the past with us not to throw it away. So, uh, and uh, it's just a wonderful resource. I taught history of the English language, so I had to study all those things and the way they came together and the wonderful things that happened to give us the ability to talk about things. Maybe we mess it up. We talk about it the wrong way, but we can talk about it. So, all right, I won't go on. It's uh, transparent and brilliant, like a diamond, the language we have. Uh, it's uh, not until you try to learn a truly foreign language do you get, get how much is packed into the most commonplace words and phrases and how much 
complication is in the grammatical patterns that you have to use and that kids learn naturally if you don't try to destroy it. Okay. So all kinds of those people, like Mogul, like Man, like all the other Osage people and like many of those who are learning now, again, uh, and my Aunt Jewel grew up speaking Mongo, and her daughters and kids are learning a lot and using a lot, and they've already forgotten a lot. So they're not losing, but man, it's hard against all the pressures and things to do. Uh, and I remember that sentence I read to you, while that is a book shaped on green, that uh, Hazel Harper and Etha Rita gave me that sentence in the beginning of Eagle Nation. He made it up for me. Because I had tried to do something, and Etha Rita said, oh, well, let us give you something. <laughs> and uh, they did it very kindly. And we put it in there. And it was, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It just says it all in a brief time. Wish I could do that. But for Hazel, who did it then, and, and Arita, for all the others who are keeping alive the tongues of men and angels, thanks for a great work of the very greatest charity. I want to thank also the people, the teachers, and the libraries who have helped me be myself better than I, I could have been, maybe not quite as bad as I would have been. <laughs> Letha Connor, my Osage teacher in Buck Creek, that Jim will remember well. I met her again after not having seen her since 1944. I met her in 2004. She was 90 or so. She was quite wonderfully clear. And she remembered all those things in Buckley. And we went over the names. She knew the students that she had in that three years there. And she had done many good things. I can't. We taped that. And I hope to get that with transcription into the Osage Tribal Museum. That evening I spent with her uh, that we talked about these things up in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, where her daughter is librarian for Haskell University now. And the teachers here at TU, where they did just beautiful things for me. Uh, I can do it. Don Hayden, I will see Don, I hope, on Monday. Don Hayden is still going, and he is, I think, 91 or 2. And Ben Hennecke is still around. Uh, these are people that helped me when I was there. But Ruth Brown was the librarian at Bartlesville, and she got given a kind of treatment which is a little bit like the Osage language. Yeah. And there's a book about her. And she was so good when I used to go there and check out all the intellectual books, uh, Tarzan of the Apes, <laughs> uh, things like that. Uh, she helped me uh, find those things. She may not have uh, thought it was very <laughs> good, but she was an awfully nice woman, and I can remember her well. At Oxford, my tutor, was, literary tutor Hugo Dyson, was one of the Inklings, along with uh, uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien was the Anglo-Saxon professor. Was the, he was the Merton professor of uh, English language and literature at Merton at that time, when I was at that college. Merton College was John Joseph Matthews' old college at Oxford, too. So we tried to go over there, and I can remember meeting a Rhodes Scholar when I was giving a reading at Kenyon. He'd come the year after me, and he said, Ah, oh, yeah, you remember you had that Indian blanket up there on, in the sofa area? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, that was the one that grandmother jumped and Aunt Arita and the others had given me when they gave me my name. So, uh, Dyson and Jeffrey Smithers, a very precise and difficult uh, teacher of Anglo-Saxon, these people were good. I go now even 
to the Bodleian Library at Oxford, to the British Library in London. I go to those places, and it is wonderful. But, you know, you can go out and look at a rock, and the scientists, they know how to read that. They can tell you how old it is. They can tell you, and they can read the earth. They're reading it now more and more. They know about Indian people. There are all these things that the earth is a library of, and we're learning to read. Uh, and so, I mean, it's not a world that's that lacking in, in beauty and strangeness and uh, revelation. It's, it's a world we just have to learn to check out from the library and read, or come to the library and read. All right. I did a reading in Berlin in November in a, to a group of students. They were what we would think of as juniors and seniors in high school. And they were held the classes, and they held the school in a library there. And uh, what a pleasure it was to go and see. That was 70% what they called minority students. Young woman with the head, you know, scarf and so on. And the others, Turks and other people who come to Germany as guest workers. And were bright, interesting <coughs> students. They liked some of the things I read, despite the fact that I wrote them here in Osage County. And a lot of them are about the places and the people here you've come across. So I think of poetry as a, a poem that should, it should build a little community of words. That's what I tried to say in some of the, the books. It, it should be a place where you can come together and feast. And uh, you can invite your friends. One on break. <laughs> and uh, if they come. You know they come because there are the poems in them. If you don't have the poems in you, and you do have them, then you can't hear or read the poems that somebody else wrote. But if you do have them in you, as the earth does, as the libraries do, as every person does, then uh, if you just maybe open that window, or that book cover, or that CD, or whatever, you can, you can be in that community. So I'm always hopeful that it does that. And I'm going to read one poem uh, and get out of here and let you guys uh, do some interesting things. And it will take just a minute. This is the poem that I wrote. It's not published yet. Uh, it would be wonderful if Mr. Maker, Mr. Leonard Maker, had written me and said, maybe we could publish this in our newspaper. Uh, I would be immensely honored and pleased if that happened. But there's a lot of important things to go in that newspaper. This is the time when the Osages are doing very difficult and very complicated things about government and finance and everything else. It's a tremendous thing. So there's a lot of other things that need to be in there. But if they took it, I would be happy. I wrote it. I was asked to compose the poem for the Lewis and Clark uh, Bicentennial commemoration, and in one of the recent Osage newspapers, uh, Chief Gray has a very fine, brief discussion of his having been there when I read that, not about me, but about what the Lewis and Clark thing was doing. He was up there, and the, t the newsletter thing is closely related to the speech I heard him give there in September this last year. I'm going to read this poem. It's called Living in the Holy Land. It was read on the Mississippi Riverfront September 23rd, 2006. It begins with a moment in the history of the United States when they were trying to do the right thing and they were in the middle of a terrible ordeal. And they didn't know whether they would last as a country or not. And I used this moment to begin the poem for the Osage people in relation to that Lewis and Clark moment 
when the United States got the Louisiana Territory and began moving the Osages around in that. Okay. Forty score and seven years ago, give or take a few heavenly days, our Osage forebears brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all beings are created equal. We had come down from the starry heavens into this holy land, and we met here the mighty waters, middle waters, rolling evermore. The waters who come down from the mountains of the west and the mountains of the east and the great lakes of the north, who move continually into the great waters of the south. We met them here, the waters who make clean this middle earth, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores. And when we met, Luigi, our elder brother, said, here stands Washashi, whose body is the waters of the earth. And the water spoke to our people in the liquid tones of a bird, saying, O oh, little ones, if you make your bodies of me, it will be difficult for death to overtake you, and you will make clean and purify all that comes to you. When you come from your home in the sky to make the flowers grow, Grandfather will paint your face with many colors and smile upon the little ones. When we heard this, our elder brother turned and we spoke together saying, now our people shall be called Washashi. We shall become the Niukonska, people of the middle waters. We sent ahead then our messengers who traveled through three valleys that were not valleys. And in the fourth valley we met those other great beings who, of whom also we made our body so that we might live to see old age and live into the blessed days. Bomba Arti, the strong, older beings of earth and water and sky, who taught us how to live in the holy land, beings among whom we established our sacred center and set up there our house of mystery, Beings who gave our sacred names, the mountain lion, the golden eagle, the cedar tree, the deer, black bear, and thunder, and the others of our planet. Beings whom we then set in heavenly order around each earthly place where we dwell, where we dance, where we give names, where we deliberate and counsel, where we decide on war or peace, where those of us in need are given food and medicine. Ho-Ega, we named our center, meaning this earth that was made to be habitable by separation from the water, meaning this camp of our people when ceremonially pitched, meaning this life proceeding from all the powers of all the cosmic beings. We set our lodges in concentric rings and kept an order in our town. We made our community of sun and stars and earth and waters a nation meant to move like them, always in good ways and lasting order. So when we dance and when we sing, we mean a harmony like those of sun and stars and of the always moving waters. 
the circle of the years and times, the circle of the always living beings in this universe. And they move with us in this our dance, while in their names and in our songs, our story will stay alive and say, we are Wajaji, those who have names, those who give names, those who are the nation we have become. And yet, ten score and three years ago, in 1803, a great change came. It was brought home to us that here we had no continuing habitation. A French dictator in Paris had sold to a Virginia slave owner in Washington this holy land with all its middle waters. Soon after, there passed by here the first few scouts of many millions on their way to the Pacific's golden shores. We sent our messengers to Jefferson under the stars and stripes. They traveled with Shoto as our friend, almost to the Atlantic Ocean shores, where they saw Jefferson, a powerful and mysterious being. He met our messengers, called himself their father, promised we would be friends, but would not let our friend Shoto be made our agent. He named instead the redhead, William Clark, who made an offer we could not refuse, and turned Missouri into a state of slaves. So our diaspora began. The young republic's presidents had crossed the Mississippi like the Rubicon, and soon, like Augustus Caesar, they ruled an empire while we moved on into a western place by whose waters we sat down and set our drum under a willow arbor, and we wept, remembering Missouri, even as we sang. Then the empire fought a great civil war between their north and south, with us between them, shot and robbed by both. And when that war was done, the squatters came. The swarming masses came on iron roads and killed the buffalo and stole our corn and fouled the river where we drank and bathed. And they and the great white father and Sherman's army said, that land was theirs, so we must move again. And so we did. We walked our trail of tears into the Indian territory, and there we made new centers for our bands. We found new visions, and with the buffalo gone, the longhorns came, and we let them fatten on our prairies. We set our lodges along Bird Creek and along Salt Creek, and we survived and sang survived with song. We lost many elders, lost many ceremonies, yet we brought back the drum with call and polka help. We sang again. And then the oil men came, the rivers of black liquid gold washed away too many of our people, too many of our ways. The oil men made us rich, they said, and the rivers of oil, the rivers of fire water, almost washed us away. But every year we sing. We set the drum at the sacred center of the Holy Land, and we dance to say alive with all our footsteps, prayers, with feathers in our moving fans and on our moving bodies to help our songs rise up to what on top, that we may live, that we may yet remain a sovereign nation in this holy land. Thank you all very much. Oh,